Ladies and gentlemen, I would like to introduce you to Gemma Lewis, who's here to talk about sustainability and recycling. Zero waste, sorry, Gemma. I only just asked her what she was going to talk about, and I still got it wrong. Um, we'll do some other business stuff afterwards or when you're having tea. But um, thank you very much for coming today. Here's Gemma. Uh, she's mic'd up, so I'll give this back to Lawrence. Yes, I'll do that. That's it. Hello? Hello, hello. Is it on? Can you hear me? Yes, that's it. <laughs> Um, hi, my name's Gemma Lewis, I was going to say Christy then, and I own a little zero waste shop in Newton Village called The Pantry Box, um, and Gary asked me about four weeks ago um, to do a little talk on zero waste and sustainability, so I, I put this together this morning, <laughs> I did leave it to the last minute, so bear with me, I'm not the best at presenting, I'll try and go slowly and not mumble too much um, but be patient with me um so i know there's some people who've been to my shop gary linda malka yeah it's quite a few people so um you'll know what i'm talking about so this is what it looks like inside for, you, for those of you who don't but i'll go on to this in a little bit more detail afterwards um it's kind of like an old-fashioned type of shop where people bring their own containers and they fill up um, I've got organic produce, like organic rice and pasta and lentils and herb spices, um, dried fruit and eco-friendly cleaning products. So you bring your own jars and containers and that way we save on the plastic pollution. So before I get into um, talking about sustainability, I just wanted to let you know that I am a complete novice to this. I'm still very much a work in progress. Um, and so there'll be no plastic shaming. If you've got a plastic bottle with you, don't be ashamed. If you used a plastic toothbrush this morning, don't worry, I'm not going to shame you. Um, it's not unusual, in fact, for me to go around to friends' houses and when they see me come in, they kind of just stick everything away. And as soon as I come in, they have to apologise. I don't usually have that. I don't, I don't know how it got here. My child brought this in. So um, there's not going to be any of that because, like I said, I still am very much learning about plus, um, about zero waste living and just trying to continuously improve my carbon footprint. In fact, five years ago, I was still working in London um, and my life looked very much more like this. I was working in high-end fashion. I was buying an extortionate amount of clothes. I flew to Portugal mainly, but all across the world every week I was on a flight. I was constantly buying takeaway coffees, constantly re rehydrating on water, loads of shoes, loads of Ubers. I had a very excessive carbon footprint. And then this happened and it just got 10 times worse. So as some of you may, uh, may know, if you've had kids or grandkids, um, then comes in the wet wipes, the nappies, the dummies, more dummies, more dummies. I was continuously losing dummies on a weekly basis. Ella, food pouches, and lots and lots of plastic toys. So one day um, we went into our local coffee shop in London, which we used to go to every day. And I got coerced into buying yet another plastic ball from the vending machine. And I just realized this was becoming a daily ritual just to quiet my little girl who's adorable down I would put in another pound she'd have a ball for maybe 10 minutes and it would get lost and and these things had been building over time and I just suddenly became overwhelmed and felt as if my plastic consumption was just getting a little bit out of control and it was something I'd been completely oblivious to prior to this I'd just been happily going a little bit like legally blonde or something um so anyway, I decided I needed to make some changes. Um, so it coincided, because it was around 2017, five years ago, with when David Attenborough brought out the first, uh, the Blue Planet 2 documentary, which some of you re might remember. But it's when the plastic pollution problem first became kind of mainstream um, or highlighted. And then it was fed into, since then it's been really fed into all the mainstream media and it's become you know, it's become second nature to us. We're all very, very aware of it. But um, because this was so 
kind of out there in the in the media at the time. I thought I would start with my start um, reducing my carbon footprint with reducing my plastic waste. So, you know, I images like this, you're all very aware of them, which is is quite um, disturbing to see, really, isn't it? Especially when we live in the coast and it's so beautiful, and that can so easily be Coney Beach, couldn't it? Um, so I started by looking at my daily routine and so I could try and build some kind of concept of where I was using plastic, how it was coming into my life and what kind of level I was at. So in the morning, wake up, brush my teeth with an electric toothbrush, put toothpaste on in a plastic tube, um, have a coffee in an espresso pod, then maybe wipe my face, have some toast, it came in plastic, have a cup of coffee, milk in the plastic um, container, change a nappy, have a coffee, have some more water, clean the house. Everything around me was just, you know, it was obvious that plastic was um, infiltrating every aspect of my life. And like with most people, I guess, it is just it is something we don't really think about. And I certainly didn't think about it prior to 2017. It didn't, it, it just wasn't on my radar. So now I live in this house with my husband, we feed the chickens every morning. No, we don't. <laughs> I'd love to tell you that this is actually my house. I've come a long way in five years. I now live here, just down zigzag lane. No, it does not. I'm in the middle of a massive renovation. <laughs> so no, um, I'd love to say that I live in an off-grid dwelling that we've built ourselves. I would love to tell you that I grow all my own fruit and vegetables and I distribute them to all the neighbours. I'd love to tell you that I can't even see my car because I haven't used it in so long. And I'd, lo I'd love to tell you that I basically kind of morphed into Felicity Kendall. But um, no, there's a reality then. Oh, and also, so the reality is I do... Uh, whereas I was, you know, I was in, like I said, high-end fashion, although I'd always, always had a penchant for charity shops and vintage shops, but now I very much try and stick to all second-hand clothes, although I do still like buying the occasional pair of trainers. I have made some changes. I do now mainly um, cycle my electric bike. Some of you may have seen me whizzing around Paul's Call uh, with my two kids in the front. However, it's a trade-off. I still have a small Mini Cooper with a petrol engine. I am a vegetarian, which I wasn't five years ago. I, um, but, I, but then I have been known to still cook my children chicken nuggets on the odd occasion. <laughs> um, and our favorite holidays are camping and staying in tree houses and trying to have staycations around the UK. But I have been known to have the odd trip to St. Lucia. <laughs> And although all my cleaning projects now, I can say, are definitely refillable, so I don't buy any plastic containers for any cleaning products, if you came around my house, you might potentially hear the tumble dryer on. So the thing is, it is definitely all about trying to not kill yourself and not kick yourself and just keep trying to make some changes. Um, so I coined this little phrase this morning. To sustain sustainability, it needs to be sustainable. So, <laughs> um, and I guess what I was just trying to say is, to in, in order to create this sustainable life that you want, you know, you need to do it slow and steady, and introduce new ideas and concepts, and make them habits, bed them in, and then you can move on and try and bring in a nice and another nice new habit. So I, I learned this about four years ago when um, we went on a camping trip. And about four years ago, that was when I was, or five years, that's when I was really trying to hit the zero waste idea hard. And I was trying to emit all plastic from my life, from um, like food to cleaning products to beauty products to oh, everything. I was just trying to be this proper zero waste warrior. Um, so we went camping and I packed herbs and spices and I packed up solar panels and I pre-cooked pre lots of tray bakes and dishes and I was really, you know, feeling good that I'd managed to reduce my plastic waste as much as possible. And then when we got to the campsite, my husband went straight into the convenience shop and came out with some digestives and some um, marshmallows to make smogs, which we now call smog gate because we actually had such a barney, we had to turn around and leave the campsite. <laughs> 
and we did end up going back and it was all fine but it did kind of it was a turning point where I realized I was, I was it was just really annoying everybody and um, I was trying to push my agenda onto my husband and onto my family when perhaps they weren't really ready for it. I was, I was just trying to do it all at the same time and it was just too much and nothing was really sticking and it was difficult and an uphill battle. And it uh, wasn't good for, it didn't, didn't make this life. It didn't make that, it didn't make the good life. It made the nagging wife. <laughs> and so it's a little bit like a diet. Has anyone been on a diet? <laughs> um, you'll know that Similar kind of thing, you know, if you try to restrict too much or if you try to, to do it too quickly or to accelerate it too much, it just doesn't work. You need to do it in a nice, steady way so that it can become a lifestyle. And um, otherwise, you end up craving and just end up gorging and eating it all. So I won't go through that. That's just the meaning of sustainability. But what I decided to do then was to do it in a more methodical way and to break down all the areas within my life kind of into departments and what, uh, what would I say, what, well, what I was currently using and what I could swap. So, for example, in dental hygiene, obviously I use toothpaste, toothbrushes and floss, and I can change my toothpaste to, into a glass jar. My toothbrush could be a bamboo toothbrush and my floss could be, I spelled it wrong, but bamboo. Um, in personal care, my moisturizer was in the plastic tub. I could buy one in a glass um, jar. Um, deodorant is normally can, can, can come in a plastic um, container. So I make sure that it's a, a re, um, like a, an eco one in a cardboard packaging or in an aluminium tin. Um, sun cream, make sure that it comes in cardboard packaging or an aluminium tin instead of plastic. So I made this kind of crib sheet and over time um, I just went through it changing the status from if, if I had succeeded and I found an eco alternative and make it green and anything I'm still working on then I make it red. So that made life a lot more um, simple and I'm pleased to say I'm, I'm, most of them for me I'd say 80% are now green, so I'm on the right tracks, but it also just helps me kind of see how well I'm doing, and it makes you, it helps you to not beat yourself up, because you can, if you make a mistake, and you buy, and I buy something that I perhaps shouldn't, don't feel like I should have, I can refer back to that, and I, I know overall I'm kind of trying my best. Um, what was I going to say about that? Okay, yeah, so um, going back to the Blue Planet documentary, it was about five years ago, and you know how how much of things changed. But I just wanted to read out some of these um, facts just to kind of sink the me message in about the the trouble that the planet is in, um, and why something needs to be done. So NASA has said that Greenland lost an average of two hundred and seventy nine billion tons of ice per year between nineteen ninety three and two thousand and nineteen. Well, the Antarctica lost about 148 billion tons of ice per year. So um, it's uh, pretty huge figures and upsetting. Um, 4.7 billion plastic straws are used and thrown away each year just in the UK. And again, this is one of those things that's unnecessary. Um, and it's always going to be a throwaway item of plastic straw. Uh, and, and there are alternatives. By 2015, there will be more plastic than fish in the sea. That's one that you might be more familiar with. I think that one said quite frequently. Um, but again, it's only 25 years off. No, it's not, it's 23 years. 27, 28 years off. <laughs> um, and it's hard to think of things that far in advance because it is the future. Like with the diet, you know, it's hard to try and make changes now for the future. But for our kids, that is, you know, it's, it's going to be horrific if you're swimming out there and there's more plastic in the sea than, I don't know how much fish we have out there, but... <laughs> Um, 8.5 billion tons of plastic has been produced since its conception and only 9% has ever been recycled. I think this, uh, this fact is quite astounding because we all take such care to split out all our rubbish every week and make sure that we're putting the plastic in the plastic and the cardboard in the cardboard. But actually, even with that, only 9% of what has ever been created has been recycled. So, um, very sobering. 11% of the world's population is currently vulnerable to climate change impacts. 
So whether that's from droughts or famine or floods or fires. Um, and a million species are at risk, including 40% of all amphibians known to science is under threat due to human impact, according to the UN. So it's all, it's all a bit depressing. Um, and like I said, trying to make changes that benefit the future now is really hard to do because you just kind of want to, we're always told to live for the moment and um, don't worry about the future too much. But for someone who's got kids, I've got a five-year-old and a seven-year-old, you know, I feel like it's, I, I think that's why it all became a bit more um, important to me, you know, about five years ago because I could see that my children were going to grow into this world and I want it to be, I want them to have the lovely experience I had growing up in Porthgall. Um, oblivious of plastic, we were buying tons of the stuff, weren't we? <laughs> but, you know, changes can be made. So that's why I decided three years ago to open um, the pantry box. So it just gives people the opportunity to shop and ha to shop in a plastic free manner and to have more um, e uh, conscientious consumer, make more conscientious consumer decisions if they want to. So like I said, I've got all rices, pastas, herbs, spices, um, <clears throat> any kind of personal hygiene, cleaning products. And it is a bit more of an effort, I suppose, to shop in this way because you've got to be a bit more organized, have your jars ready, take them, have them filled up. But um, I think there's when people come into the shop, they feel like there's something nice about it. It feels quite wholesome. And essentially, you know, you are saving a lot of plastic doing it this way. I started very small, um, just in this little horse box. Some of you may have seen me. It was in October 2019 down by the harbour. And um, we're a bit bigger now, so we've got a little garden and um, probably about 300 products in there. So um, and it's doing really well. So this is examples. People come and drop off their jars or hand them to me and I fill them all up. They can go and have a coffee if they want and then I give them back and they can stick it all straight back in the cupboard. Um, since we've been opened in 2019, we've, so we've managed to sell, so save, essentially, that's why I've got these pictures up, I don't sell these things, but save 633 litres of washing up liquid, uh, 733 litres of laundry liquid, 198 litres of conditioner, 374 litres of shampoo, 409 kilos of rice, and the list goes on and on. So. It's not huge, huge figures, but it definitely feels like it's, it's trying. <laughs> Is it going to make a difference? Is it going to help with these kind of situations? Of course it's not. A tiny little shop in, hidden away down a back alley in Newton isn't really going to have any impact globally at all. But I like to think that it perhaps will have the ripple effect. So by me making these changes and improving my carbon footprint my sister's now doing it a bit more and my niece is definitely doing it a bit more and then customers come into the shop and then they might think well, I might cycle a bike a bit more or I might change my energy supplier or I might travel fly a little bit less or you know so it's this ripple effect and um that grows and grows and I think there's something like over 200 zero waste shops now around the UK. So if that's happening everywhere and having this ripple effect, then you never know, potentially, it might start to make a difference. I think the biggest hope for me is that my children will see me trying at least to um, live a little bit more um, environment, uh, environmentally conscientious and they'll just grow up naturally doing it. I mean, it's definitely been a hard slog for the first little bit and um, trying to explain to them why mum is so so annoying <laughs> it's gonna use a different word when I won't let them have the things they want um like clothes or toys or you know why Santa brings everything from a charity shop but um, <laughs> you know they've kind of um they just accept it now and they know that I, I kind of am quite strict with that but they like it and they much prefer charity shops and vintage things they love all old you know old vintage toys and so they've really come around and for example for their birthday parties 
when they have um, parties, everyone has to either make them a present if they want to bring a present or just give them one of their old toys. And I did, my mum was mortified that I was putting this on the invitation um, for the first few years. But now the other kids in the class have started to do the same as well. Or So, you know, there, that is that ripple effect. Um, and they enjoy it. I think they like being a bit different. <laughs> so I say to myself. <laughs> um, Okay, so with this in mind, and then, you know, the fact that the kids are obviously the future, they're the ones that are going to be around in the future, and they're the ones that are going to be around to make the decision, the, the changes that we need. Um, last year, I was lucky enough, in the, this term la last year, I was lucky enough to work with West Park, and Mrs. Morgan, the teacher, allowed me to start a project up there. So I donated um, one of these big 200 litre containers of hand soap. And then I worked with the year six kids. Is that interfering a bit? <laughs> oh, is it? Sorry. Is that better? Ah, yeah. Ah, okay. Sorry. Um, so I worked with the year uh, six, six kids. Are they still doing it? Mm, should I put it on the table? Is that better? Hello? Hello, hello. Okay, I worked with the year six kids um, and they came up with their own name. So basically I gave them this um, 200 litres of hand soap and the idea is for them to develop in West Park Primary School down the road their own in-house zero waste shop that they completely manage themselves. Um, is it better if I take it off? Yeah? Just carry on, okay. <laughs> um, and... So they came up, first of all, with their own name. So they've called themselves Eco Green Leaf. Um, they came up with their own logo, which they designed. And then we, we, we created a business. We got it registered. <laughs> um, we divided them into departments, like an official business. So they had a human resources team, finance, marketing, and operations. And they had heads of, of each department and assistants. Um, and then we spent the summer term... Um, Selling the, selling the hand soap, which is great. There was, you, you might have gone down, yeah. So it was over the course of a month, and it was during COVID, so it was a little bit more tricky. But every day, we'd roll the big containers down onto the playing fields, and the parents would queue with their empty bottles. The kids would fill it up, and they weigh it, and they'd give the change. You know, it, was, it was really good. It was really successful, and they enjoyed it. And in the end, there's £352 um, profit. So I'm working with them again this year. Um, and they can decide what they want to spend with the money, buy with the money. So um, to increase, to grow their, their range. So they are buying shampoo bars, uh, toothbrushes, toothpaste and deodorant. Um, and that's going to be going on sale after um, when, when we go back for the summer term. And then hopefully they'll make a profit and they'll hand it down to the next year fives now. But they'll be, the year six will be teaching the year fives. So it should just keep that legacy going until eventually they'll hopefully have a fully functioning zero waste shop in, in house. So it started with Best Park. I'd love it if it, if it worked and if I iron out all the um, logistics, we could move it into Nottage and Newton and Porthcawl Primary and who knows, it could go, you know, through all the schools in, um, in Wales. It'd be a lovely idea and I think that would be an ambition I'd like to strive for. Um, and eventually, like I said, they'll have their, their own range. And the idea is that hopefully they will just, by having their own in-house zero waste shop, they will just become tuned out from plastic and see alternatives and, and it, it won't be the go-to all the time when they're picking up something whatever it might be maybe they'll think hang on a minute why have we got this zero waste shop in our school is there another alternative that's less damaging to the environment and hopefully I'll have to buy less of these that's the end <laughs> <laughs> Sorry about the mic. Can you ask a question? Yes. Uh, first of all, can I say, I think it's brilliant that you're doing it with the kids. Thank you. Because it's all right talking to us. Yeah. But it's the next generation. Yeah. Or two down from me. Yeah. <laughs> um, I think that's great. Can I ask what happens to the rest of the plastic that's not recycled? Is it just landfill or...? Well, I think, yeah. I, think, I mean, I, I would probably need to go into that a bit more. But I, yeah, I presume a lot of it is just re is it's in the oceans. 
It's in landfill. It's still in use, I guess. Like, do that. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it's, it's a. It's a it's it's a true statistic. So I don't know exactly how, where the breakdown is, um, but most of it is still on the planet in one form or another. It's horrendous to think mm. that if yeah. we are doing all this recycling, yeah. it's not being recycled. Yeah, I, I mean, because there's 8.5 billion tonnes, perhaps, you know, 9% is still a huge amount. It's just in comparison to how much is being actually produced. And I suppose the one that you are allowed to be annoying. Yes, yes, but that. Also, to see the amount of plastic that's exported to other countries, because that's what we've done. Yeah, we know. Yeah, yeah, we feel like we can just kind of yeah wash our hands of it. Then that's how we think we're actually recycling. Yeah, we're not. no. We're sending it, we're exporting yeah. it, it's going to publishing. Business. And actually, it's probably within our, you know, if they, if they gave a breakdown <laughs> of how well the UK is doing, they'd probably include that. Yeah, I don't know how to find out that no. detail. Yeah, you know, I don't want to look into that. Yeah, because yeah. I think that detail is important. Yeah, yeah. Because in other countries, they're sometimes making money from yeah. the yeah. energy gardening as waste. Yeah, exactly. Well, in, in some of the countries, like Malaysia, the plastic that we send over, then they obviously collect it all, and they make these eco bricks. Um, I started to make them at one point, and then sending them over, and my husband was like, "This that just doesn't make any sense. They've got all the plastic, they've got all the rubbish there, and actually they need. It's probably you know it's a profession. They get all the plastic, they put it into bottles like milk bottles or Coke bottles, and then with those plastic bottles, they they use them as bricks to build houses, and so, yeah. Sure. Um, you know the uh, the products that you sell. Yes. Obviously, you, you, your aim is to save plastic. Yeah. Yeah. So when I come for my hand wash or whatever, yeah. I bring them to the bottom of me. But are the products themselves produced in a sustainable way? Yes. Yeah. So all of the so the, the all the cleaning products that I get are from a company called Phil, and they're in Northamptonshire, and they're a small family-run business, and all of the you know, um, all the ingredients are. E e ecologically sourced and the environment is like their number one priority when they're considering the ingredients how to make it um all the ethics behind the business yeah yeah because i mean you, you could just buy it from anywhere otherwise this kind of has to be quite holistic the other thing is that that chart that you showed us where you you're listing all the plastic products and alongside what you're doing to to avoid them uh yes it'd be quite nice to make those available oh yeah i've got yeah i printed I printed a couple out, so if, if anyone would, they could photocopy. Oh, I didn't want to print them out. You know, I didn't want to be wasteful if nobody wanted them. But uh, and actually, uh, now that I've printed it out, it's very small. So I'll send it to Gary, and then maybe Gary could um, forward it on if anyone wanted. And then you can, you know, start to cross things off as you go along. But it's very small, looking at it. <laughs> yeah. Can I ask you what form the deodorant is in in a pack cardboard? What? What's yeah, they, um, so you can get deodorants in a few different forms now. So the one I use currently is literally just like a soap bar, um, loose. It comes in um, just like a paper pack, paper paper wrap. Yeah, no, it's just a paper wrap. So you take it out like a soap bar and you just hold on to it like a soap bar. But a lot of the other ones can come in a cardboard tube, almost like a toilet roll, and then you pop it up. Um, or other ones might come in a like a almost like a lip balm aluminium tin that you can put on um i think they're the main kinds yeah and they, they work just as i mean spraying like chemicals art artificial chemicals into your armpits is never going to be good so it's, it's it might not keep you quite as fresh all day but it's um, <laughs> it's probably offsetting a lot of other terrible things you know if you're like spraying chemicals into your pores that'd be good just picking up your yes. theme of sustainability yes. uh, and picking up what Carolyn was saying, the, the sheer joy of seeing the children yeah. uh, engaging themselves in this. Do you find uh, year by year that the children themselves, that the enthusiasm is there when they come to the birthday yeah. parties, that they are more and more sort of consciously, or not, not consciously, unconsciously coming along with... Uh, with, with, with um, oh. Non-plastic. Um, well, they, they, so the first year I did it with um, Cozy, my little girl, they absolutely loved it. It was the best part of the party, just showing her 
like, open my present, please open my next, please open my next. They love that they'd made something or given them something that they've had for years. Um, one boy brought him a little hamper of, um, of a little hamper of cucumbers from his greenhouse. And, and there's been uh, like all sorts of weird, like, Robots made from cardboard that they're so proud of, and it's taken them a lot to hand it over. <laughs> um, and then, yeah, like I said, the, the other kids have definitely followed suit to certain degrees. Like having, even if it's not with the presents necessarily, they a lot of them have been having more um, eco parties, like crafting parties or bush parties or things that don't involve. Um, I mean, the, what, one of the big things that they find it seem to find it difficult to get away from is the ubiquitous party bag you know that is just a plastic bag filled with other plastic rubbish that just gets broken straight away so it'd be nice to move away from that but it will take time <laughs> yeah yeah hi um eddie morgan uh, i run the uh, coordinator of the sustainability group uh, in u3a oh, okay hi um and um for information of people who don't come to the sustainability group, uh, we have a variety of checklists online. Ah. Um, and I'd very much like to add yours to that. Oh, yeah, lovely. Um, and uh, uh, if anyone wants, who doesn't come to the sustainability group would like uh, any of those checklists, I'm quite happy to uh, distribute put them off and, and, or, and or email them uh, and get them to people. Okay, yeah, great. Um, I'd just, for your information, we, we have in the UK in excess of 90 uh, U3A sustainability type groups uh, and we meet every three months as a, um, uh, as a national coordination okay. uh, group. Yeah. And so we're, we're sharing experiences across uh, the UK and I'm very much trying to generate the, the, the ripple effect that you're um, uh, you're oh great! About. Yeah, it was obviously a big focus there, and this is a big, you know, it's a big number. Um, and I think it does. The more people do it, is it happens by osmosis, isn't it? Your neighbours doing it, it's like, well, I think I should start doing that as well. So, hopefully, I mean, the pro the problem is that there's not there's not that much time. Things have to kind of be done now. And um, it's like, has, has anyone watched that film? Don't look up with Leonardo DiCaprio. No, oh, it's a good one to watch if you haven't. And, it, you know, that's what we're living in. It's, it's so obvious that something terrible could happen, but we're just going, la, la, la. <laughs> but, um, you know, things do have to change, otherwise this, this it's not looking good. Can I ask you just one question about the, on the plastic side? You gave us that horrific figure of just 9% mm -hmm. uh, is, is being recycled. Yeah. Are there any inroads into that? Uh, is, is that recycling? Uh, is there any scientific movement you are you aware of that that nine percent is going to be yeah. going to be higher? Well, I don't know. Is the honest answer? I'd need to look into it a bit more. You just um, touched on this. I don't know, um, you know, what the plans are for that because it's such a such a low number. But like I said, it's such a huge amount eight, eighty five billion um, tons of plastic. But it's it's, a, it's still a large number, that I guess, that's being recycled. But just in comparison to the amount that's being produced, it's it's nowhere near. And you're going to constantly be paying catch up, and because it's very very difficult to get rid of, isn't it? I think in um, in mm. terms of both the UK government mm. uh, and uh, EU initiatives, uh, what people are trying to work to is something called the circular economy. Mm. Um, and that is about you know, if you are going to produce plastic, um, then it should go somewhere to be reproduced into to you know, be reprocessed into another product, mm. uh, and for that to happen uh, across the economy. Mm. So where we now have a lot of throwaway goods, mm. you know, like your, your, your phone, you check the drawer, mm. it stays there for a few years, and when you have a tidy up, you check it out. Which I think is what we talked about yesterday. Yesterday, yeah. Um, uh, it is to make sure that those products are produced as recyclable products mm -hmm. uh, and also that their materials can then be, you know, there are systems in place to take those products uh, and make them into new products. So we, we mine our waste mm -hmm. effectively. Yeah. Did you have a question? Mm -hmm. The lady at the back, did you have a question? When the yes. You say something. Yeah, go on. <laughs> well, to my generation, Growing up in the 50s, and my mother being 
you know, managing a household in, in the 30s, we were always very conscious of yeah. make do and mend, you might say, Absolutely. and, and um, recycling everything. And um, it's always been in my sort of psyche. Yeah. But then, of course, we have the wonderful 60s and 70s, mm -hmm. and we had a car, we didn't have our bicycles anymore, we had a car, and we've seen wonderful things that have been invented. And of course, we've realised now that wasn't so good for anybody. No. So I'm so thrilled to see this new approach which you advocate. Yeah, I think we've done so much damage, haven't we, in just such a very, very, very short amount of time. So if we can adapt adopt some of those go back to that mentality um which doesn't seem unfeasible because it, it used to happen like that it's just because we've, we've become so um accustomed to just having a throwaway culture just taking whatever we want whenever we want it not trying to make anything from scratch we just need to change our wiring because someone like me has, has you know I've only ever been born into that kind of um lifestyle I was born in the 80s, so consumerism was very, probably at its height, wasn't it? Just didn't, didn't have, give it any consideration. You know, what you feel about trains, um, it's my great passion trains, and it's been wonderful to see all these volunteers all over the country um, absolutely rebuilding the lovely old steam trains. Okay, and, cool. And, uh, exactly. I do hope they would take back the freight trains because there's been, you know, it was all taken off the railways and onto the roads in these enormous mm -hmm. um, vehicles to clutter up the roads. Mm -hmm. it's, they are coming back, the freight trains, to take the freight. Okay, I wasn't, aware, I wasn't aware of that. Um, yeah, anything that takes things off the road, really, isn't it? It's a bonus. Hopefully, it you know, we'll all give our cars up and get on the train. Well, that would be nice. <laughs> David? Just a comment, really. When my wife and I go for a walk, yeah. we always take a bag with us yeah. and pick up the, the plastic bottles that are thrown away and the aluminium cans. And we never come back with an empty bag. Yeah. It's usually overflowing yeah. by the time we get home. And that's just a short walks around both coast. Yeah, I know. We, we, start, we only actually started to do the same thing during lockdown and because um, litter was really bad around, you know, uh, at one point, I, I just remember it, there being a you know, definite increase. Um, and so we've carried on doing that as well. And it's, it's yeah, it's terrible. I, I don't know how people could just drop litter on the ground. But um, hopefully doing projects with the schools, like you said, is the way to get the message out there and to try and change behaviour. I think when your grandchildren start lecturing you, yeah. Know, yeah. Right. yeah. <laughs> it is hard though because some people just don't um, see the value in it, they, re they really don't and they're not going to change and it's clear, you know, even people my um, generation, they don't see um, its importance and they've got other priorities as well, you know, price sometimes is the driving factor so if something is cheaper then that's going to be what they go for and unfortunately plastic by its nature is mass produced and cheaper but it doesn't necessarily well it does last that's the problem but <laughs> plastic bottles i'm trying to buy glass is that <coughs> better than plastic i oh, breaks them. and um, it's, it's a little bit dearer and then i decided well i don't want bottled water i'll have water out of the tap yeah well, it's, that's what I said about that ripple effect, even within your own se self. You know, you've gone, right, you've made one step forward and then, oh, actually, I don't need to buy water from a shop. But it's, you know, and it's little things like that, making little incremental changes all the time. Large corporations, we need yes. to get through to yeah. them, isn't it? Yeah. You know, places like Asda, you can't go and buy a couple of mm. pieces of fruit. No. Or something like that, or, or some meat, because it's all wrapped in plastic. Yeah, I know. Yeah. Like, yeah. yeah. It's crazy. What did you just I know. Maybe that does. It does. Maybe it has to come. To, it it will be consumer power in the end, won't it? They'll only change once consumers start to demand for to, to see things differently. I, I'm sure Theresa May said in 2025 each supermarket was going to have a plastic-free aisle. So, um, you know, maybe, yeah. 
I was thinking of talking to the Aldi when they ke- when it, when it arrives, just to say, look, would they, um, what's the word? Uh, like test it out, but there's another word for it. Anyway, do a trial of having a plastic of a plastic free aisle there. Um, but I'm conscious that. Oh, I'm conscious that I go and go get my kids. I'm conscious. She's got to run off and get <laughs> children from the school. Oh, so yeah. um, <laughs> ask you all to say thank you very much. Uh, thank you. <laughs>